Happy Valley. On BBC One Now, Crime Watch. The real life midsummer murder. It's a lovely house. It's very quiet. We were asleep in the house at the time. The true cost of crash for cash. She was a lovely daughter, but she's gone now. The exclusive inside story of a female serial killer. She said, I wouldn't hurt you. I wouldn't kill you. And the prolific burglar targeting the rich and famous. That freedom has been taken away. Catching the criminals, protecting the public. This is Crime Watch. Hello and welcome to Crime Watch. We are live for the next hour with this month's latest crime investigations, news and appeals. There are dozens of detectives right here in the studio ready for your call. Yes, and they urgently need your help to find a killer at large in Glasgow responsible for the murder of Jean Campbell as she walked her dog just yards from her home. I'll have my latest collection of faces, people wanted for bank robbery, drug dealing and stealing flash cars. And some incredible CCTV, including this numpty who tried to rob a bank wearing a high-vis vest. But we begin with what's become known as the true life midsummer murder. For artist Valerie Graves and her family, it was meant to be the ideal Christmas break, house-sitting for friends in Bosham on the south coast of England. But the festivities ended with the brutal murder of the 55-year-old grandmother. We always did Christmas as a family. It's also Mum's birthday, so double celebration sort of thing. We just couldn't comprehend how, how, how it could happen. We were asleep in the house at the time. Valerie Graves spent last Christmas with her family house-sitting for a friend in the small village of Bosham, just outside Chichester. We were always invited down at weekends whenever we wanted to come down and stay, so it's just been a sort of a, a, a friendly relationship. And when they've not been there, we've been invited to use the home. Several family members dropped in over the festive period, whereas a core group made up of her sister Janet, her partner Nigel and Valerie's mother Eileen remained at the house for most of the holiday. Jan and Valerie's mother was ill prior to Christmas and she was hospitalised with pneumonia. And Valerie had, had come down from Scotland as a carer and it was just decided that uh, we would be able to all meet over the Christmas period and all stay in the house because it was larger. It's a lovely house. It overlooks Chichester Harbour. There's a, a creek inlet, wide open spaces. It's very quiet. We'd stayed at the house a couple of times a few years before, so it's somewhere that we knew. Christmas Day was a time for a double celebration. It was also Valerie's birthday. We always did Christmas as a family. Birthday celebrations in the morning and Christmas in the afternoon. Um, she likes having the grandkids around for Christmas. I know we were really important to Mum, um, and that she was proud of us and that she spoke really highly of both of us. She was a big kid at heart, so she loved playing with the grandkids and messing around being silly. She spent the whole day playing with Evie, my daughter running around the house, playing all sorts of games, playing with all the different toys. So they had a lovely day. After a busy few days of hosting the festivities and with various family members going their separate ways, Valerie, her sister and mother sat down to watch a film. Nigel had been out with friends. Bit of match of the day. He returned home at about 9.20 that evening. I had a busy day, so everybody started to drift off to bed around about 10, 
and left me sitting there watching TV, and I went up later. I was usually last to bed. Before going to bed, I'd make sure that all the, the doors were locked and all the lights were out. Um, and I then obviously made my way upstairs to bed. Valerie was staying in the downstairs bedroom at the back of the house. Detectives believe someone may have been watching her as she prepared to go to sleep. was bludgeoned with a hammer. A single strike would have been enough to kill her, but the attacker continued, landing dozens of blows to her face. Despite the ferocity of the murder, it went unnoticed by the others sleeping in the house. Jan was up first. The bedroom door was 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 open, not not wide open, but slightly open, more open than a jar. I sat in the bedroom and I was reading for half an hour. Then I came down and spoke to Jan and said, "Oh, is Valerie up? Because her door was open." Not up yet. I think she's in with Mum. She said no, she hadn't seen her. Her mother was in the front bedroom on the ground floor. She may well have had a, a bad turn in the night, and Valerie may have gone in there to look after her or be with her. So we didn't think anything, anything out of the ordinary. Do you mind going to the shop? At 20 past nine, Nigel went out to buy bread and milk. It was then that Janet decided to see if Valerie wanted a cup of tea. As I pulled into the house, the paramedic car with its lights flashing parked in the drive. Your so my first reaction was that perhaps Eileen had been taken ill and I saw the paramedic in the in the bedroom that Valerie was occupying and that's when Jan sort of told me that she'd found her and uh, that, that, that she was dead. You, you end up asking why? Your, your brain can't and comprehend it. And who would want to hurt someone so lovely? I don't think I'm over the shock yet. No. Um, I don't think we ever will be. <clears throat> no. She's uh, going to miss so much, miss her grandchildren growing up, things she wanted to do, places she wanted to see and travel. She's not going to get to see any of it now. We're not going to be there to... Uh, <laughs> to do it with her. There are silly times that I think, oh, I need to text Mum. And not seeing her again is just horrible. Well, the detective leading this investigation is Detective Superintendent Nick May. He joins us now with his team. <clears throat> a very violent case, a very mysterious case, this one. Yes, Valerie was found dead on Monday the 30th of December um, in an address where she didn't usually live and where very few people would have known that she was there. One of the clues that you do have is the murder weapon. You found that. Tell us about this. Yes, we have. Um, the hammer is uh, very similar to this one. It's about 30 centimetres long. We actually found it about 800 metres from, from the address and um, in, a, in an entrance to a farmyard. And we'd be very interested to find anyone who saw or heard anything suspicious in that area. Now, you want to hear from viewers who have maybe concerns about someone but, but really don't know if they should come forward. What would you like to say to them tonight? Yeah, I believe very strongly that the person who did this will have a history of violence and that somebody close to them, either in a professional or personal capacity, will, um, will have an idea about this and I'd like that person to call tonight. Somebody watching might think, you know, I do want to get in touch. I feel afraid. I mean, you know, this person murdered a woman lying in her bed with a hammer. What would you say to reassure them? 
Uh, this is not about grassing, this is not about snitching, this is about catching a killer before it happens again. Um, and the people can call in and they do not have to leave their name tonight. OK, Detective Superintendent Nick May, thank you very much for updating us on that. It's a mystery, but surely Valerie's family deserve to know what happened. There's a £10,000 reward for information that leads to an arrest and conviction of the murderer. So if you can help, please, I would urge you to do the right thing and call our studio tonight. There's the number. It's 0500 600 600. Martin. And we start our wanted faces tonight with Milo Cicek. Detectives from West Yorkshire urgently need to trace him in connection with a rape at Knife Point in Bradford three weeks ago. The 20-year-old, who's originally from Slovakia, may well be with his pregnant girlfriend. He has a tattoo of the face of Jesus on his right inner forearm. Cicek is considered to be dangerous. If you know where he is, call the police immediately. Next is Michael McInerney. He's wanted in connection with the death of a man who was thrown from a moving van during a robbery. McInerney, who uses a variety of aliases, including Michael Aimer and John Patrick or Lee Connor, has links throughout the home counties. The 33-year-old, who has an Irish accent, is an identical twin, but Michael is distinguishable by a red dot on his left eyelid and a scar on the inside of his right forearm. Michael McInerney is considered dangerous, so if you see him, just call 999. Number three is Ardian Bujaj. Police want to trace him in relation with the possession and supply of cocaine worth more than half a million pounds. 40-year-old Bujaj, who is known as Albanian Danny, has links to Manchester, Derby and London. Now, despite being Albanian, he likes to pretend he's Italian and he may well be using false identity documents. And lastly, for now, is Carl Patrick Delaney also known as Paddy. Officers want to speak to the 37-year-old about the theft of computer equipment worth almost £2 million from the back of a lorry which is en route to the Netherlands. Delaney, who has an Irish accent and links to County Kildare and to Kent. Now, all the faces are on the website. If you know where they are, call and text the numbers on screen. Texts will be charged at your standard message rate. Now, crash for cash, where criminals stage fake accidents to make money from the insurance claim, is costing the industry nearly £400 million a year. That's passed on to us, of course, adding around about 50 quid to each of our premiums. But more worrying is the risk to other motorists. Earlier this month, the final member of a gang who caused the first fatality from one of these crashes was jailed. The victim, Baljinder Gill, was 34, and her family have given their first interview to Crime Watch. She was a lovely daughter, and she was full of life. But she's gone now. She's very caring. And the bubbly girl, he's to look after everybody. My sister was like my second mother. There's no one ever who will ever take her place. Never take her place. Crash for Cash is a scam that puts innocent drivers in danger. Here's how it works. In most collisions, when one vehicle crashes into the back of another, the driver of the vehicle behind is deemed to be at fault. <laughs> So the fraudsters create accidents for which that driver can be blamed. They then make their money from the claim to the insurance company. There are three types of crash for cash. Sometimes criminals simply fill in the paperwork stating a crash has happened. These are called ghost claims. At other times, in staged crashes, they deliberately damage two of their vehicles away from the public eye. But the category that causes the most risk to other drivers is the induced scam, when an innocent motorist is made the at-fault driver. Gangs will often go out in convoy to target a victim. Just one fake accident can earn the fraudsters up to £30,000. Here at Silverstone, the insurance industry's research teams are demonstrating automatic braking systems, which they believe could reduce collisions. A sensor on the vehicle detects when the car in front is too close and slows down to avoid hitting it. 
But until such time as it's technically impossible to stage a crash, it's up to detectives to investigate the criminals behind the scam. The scale of the problem is vast. We're talking about organized criminal gangs, criminal gangs who are going out onto the roads and deliberately causing collisions. I would imagine the rewards for them are significant. For the people who are involved in this, yes, the rewards are significant. We're talking about tens of thousands per crash, which obviously equates to millions of pounds for one organized gang. We know from our experience of dealing with these gangs that that money is also uh, used in drugs, people trafficking, firearms, uh, and sometimes terrorism. Police typically make several arrests during the course of a single investigation. They often receive leads from the Insurance Fraud Bureau, set up by the industry to spot bogus claims. We have information about all claims and policies across all motor insurance. We then collect that data together and we analyse that to find the trends and patterns that the fraudsters are trying to hide from us. They estimate one in seven personal injury claims are linked to suspected crash for cash scams. But the human cost of the crime was shown when Belginda Gill became the first person to die as a result of crash for cash. A gang targeting motorists on the A40 outside London caused a chain of collisions in which the 34-year-old was involved. Balginda's car was left disabled in the third lane of this road when a Renault traffic van uh, came down the road in lane three and crashed into her car. Balginda was killed instantly. Balginda has gone. To me, there is no life for me without her. Because when a person is gone, he'll never come back. It's only memories with us. This isn't really happening. It didn't really hit home for a long time. For a long time, I just refused to accept that it happened. I miss her a lot. Earlier this month, Irenia Staniak became the last of the gang to be convicted of causing Balginda's death by dangerous driving and conspiracy to commit fraud. He was jailed for nine years. The other members of the gang were previously sentenced to a total of 38 years for their part in the scam. As a police service, it's really important for us to make sure that we leave no stone unturned in trying to investigate such serious matters as these. We will investigate it, we will find you, and we will bring you to justice. My wife, my youngest son, they're looking at me, they're asking the answers. Where did we go wrong? What did we do to deserve this? And I don't have no answers for it. Well, I'm joined now by DCI Dave Wood of City of London Police, whose team deals with all kinds of insurance fraud, as well as BBC One Formula One presenter and lifelong motoring obsessive Susie Perry. Welcome to you both. Dave, to you, first of all, uh, Crash for Cash has been around quite a long time. It's evolving, though. Explain a bit more about it. That's right, Kirsty. We've seen a recent trend which goes by the name of Flash for Crash. What that involves is villains plotting up their vehicle at a busy junction. They then beckon the oncoming innocent motorists to proceed ahead by flashing their lights. As they do so, the villains drive their car into the innocent motorist, causing a crash, which then creates their meal ticket. It's horrendous, isn't it? Uh, we saw the devastation that's been caused to Belginda's family by her death. Um, your family was involved, I mean, quite recently in something that you suspect was of this type. Yeah, well, a couple of years ago, it was a classic, really. Three cars on a slipway, it was my father, him being the third car. The first car acted quite erratically. The second car slammed on the brakes. My dad went straight into the back of that second car, wrote his car off, and then realised when he got home, he had no car, was in complete shock, and thought that he'd probably been scammed as well. Uh, Dave, when, when people watch this tonight <coughs> and they see some of that CCTV film, I mean, what do we do? It's, it's very difficult to, to give advice, surely, to motorists. What advice would you give them if they get caught up in something like I'd this? I'd say three things I'd like to say to them is, is, first, be safe when you get out of the vehicle. Secondly, be alert, so record any details that you can at the time, such as the location, the time, any um, damage to either vehicle, the number of occupants in the other vehicle, that's quite important. Right. And if they're confident enough, take photographs of the damage and also the driver of the other vehicle. 
And the last one would be is if they genuinely think it is a crash for cash, then get on the phone and request the police to attend the scene of the crime. Right, all good advice. Uh, what about the action of driving itself? Day to day, Susie, what should mm. we do when we're out on motorways, dual carriageways? I think making awareness is, is key, really. So if you are aware, you drive differently anyway. So if you see a car that is behaving erratically, stay well away from it. And also think about the stopping distance. Make sure there's enough space between you and the car in front so that you can brake safely. Better something chance. Happens. Yeah, of getting out of trouble. Yeah. You love cars, you also love gadgets. What's this we've got here and why might it be useful? Well, of all the technologies that are being trialled at the moment, I think these dash cams here are the little heroes because they film everything that's happening through your windscreen. They're simple to use and that's the evidence right there for you on a memory card. So it's much better than word of mouth or drawing a picture. The evidence is on the stick. Great advice. Thanks to you as well, Dave. Thanks, Susie. Let's now go over to Martin. Time for some crimes caught on camera now, starting with an extremely violent attack at a hotel in South London earlier this year. A man in a dark jacket walks up to the locked doors of the hotel during the early hours of a Sunday morning in March. Two men who are part of a gang who'd been harassing him in the street follow him into the foyer, accompanied by a tiny brown puppy. A security guard opens the door as a third man carrying a skateboard arrives. The man in the dark jacket fronts up to one of the gang who was threatening to stab him and lashes out in desperation. And then it all kicks off, with the men moving into the reception area. One of the gang hits the man in the dark jacket with the skateboard, and then they set about the victim in earnest, punching and kicking him and stamping on his head. One of them repeatedly hits him with the skateboard, while another kicks him in the face. With the victim now unconscious, they leave. But they aren't finished. Just minutes later, they and the dog are back, and the violence erupts once more as the man in the jacket with the red sleeves sets about the victim with the skateboard, hitting him over and over again. Finally, the three of them walk off. These thugs injured the victim so badly his brain swelled up, and he is still recovering from his injuries. Tell us who they are tonight. A man in a black jacket and cap walks into a bookmaker's in Manchester city centre on a Thursday evening last December. He chats briefly to the man behind the desk before leaping over the counter and grabbing him. The pair grapple with the man in the cap punching the cashier several times. During the struggle, the attacker tried to open the cash drawer, but it was locked, so he ended up fleeing empty handed. Now he took nothing but he left this lovely shot of his ugly mug. Name, please. If you need another look, all the CCTV you've just seen is on the website. Call and text the numbers on screen if you can help. Right, still to come, will someone watching tonight be able to name the killer of Jean Campbell? Murdered in a Glasgow park just moments after these pictures were taken. And some good updates on previous appeals, including a conviction for this thug who bottled a man in a row about his sexual prowess. But first, Matthew's got a roundup of the latest crime news. A female teacher has died after a stabbing at a school in Leeds. Police have arrested a 15-year-old male pupil in connection with the incident, and he is currently in custody. Officers were called to Corpus Christi Catholic College this morning. The teacher, who has not yet been named by police, was taken to hospital but later pronounced dead. Police have said there are no ongoing risks to pupils or staff at the school. Now, on our last programme, we featured a new appeal on the Madeleine McCann case. Officers were looking into a dozen crimes across the Algarve where an intruder entered British children's bedrooms. Well, since the programme, more than 500 people called police with information. Detectives say, as a result, a further five sexual assaults have come to light, as well as one near miss. We'll keep you posted on any further developments. Now, a triple murderer has been awarded £815 in compensation after his nose hair trimmers were damaged. Kevan Thakra, who's serving a minimum 35-year sentence, was awarded the sum after reportedly becoming stressed over the damage to his trimmers and the loss of some personal items, including photographs and fruit juice. The losses occurred when the 26-year-old was being transferred to a new prison 
after he stabbed three prison guards with a broken bottle. The district judge ruled that the damage to his items was aggravated because the Ministry of Justice hadn't apologised promptly or sincerely enough. Finally, have you ever wondered how criminals feel when red-hot pepper spray is squirted into their eyes? These new police recruits in Cheshire know full well. Once qualified, the trainee specials can use the spray to disable violent suspects. But before they use it on others, they're asked to experience it for themselves. We will work out quite easy by your reaction whether you've done it or not. Um, so if anybody doesn't want to do it, now's the time to say because otherwise we'll be wasting aftercare that somebody else will need. The pepper spray is designed to scald and temporarily blind. It works. Ah! <laughs> OK. OK, let's just keep an eye on what we're doing. Yes, it hurts. It's all right, it hurts. Good stuff. OK, you can look out the other eye, remember. This exercise is featured on a new BBC One daytime series which follows recruits from their training to their first days on patrol, including new special Sarah Johnson. Well done. Well done. Well done. Okay, put yourself on the line now. That's good stuff. Okay. It's all right. I have to say, that was actually worse than childbirth. It was agony. It was horrible. If you have to use it now, you have a little bit more empathy with someone, won't you? You go, actually, I know that really hurts. And you can see more of that series first time on the front line on BBC One, weekday mornings at 11.30. Every case we feature has questions which need answering. But the murder of Jean Campbell has more than most. The 53-year-old was brutally attacked back in December whilst walking her dog in Cran Hill in the east end of Glasgow. So why would anyone want to kill this popular grandmother? Jean Campbell had lived on the Cranhill estate in the east end of Glasgow for more than 30 years. It was home to her, her husband John and dog Kai. Her three children had also grown up there. She was a tiny wee woman who took no nonsense. But she wouldn't see anybody left out. She would do anything for anybody. So she would not. Jean had lived through challenges. She lost one of her sons when he was just 24 and 14 years ago had a brain hemorrhage. We didn't think she would have survived that. She did. But she was determined. On Friday, the 13th of December last year, Jean spent the day on the estate. At about 3.30 p.m., she popped to the local shops. CCTV shows her buying a newspaper, some drinks, as well as food for her dog. Must be a winner. Right, okay. Later that evening, shortly after her husband John left for his night shift at work, she spent time alone in their flat, only leaving briefly to take the dog out for a walk. My dad always walked the dog before he went to work. I do know. Obviously, later on that night, she's took the dog out twice, for whatever reason. And the second time, she never made it home. Her final walk was at 10.30 p.m. It's unlikely she'd planned to be out for long. She left home just wearing her pyjamas, coat, socks and flip-flops. These are the last images of her alive before she entered Cranhill Park. It was a spot she regularly went to. She was less than 100 metres from her home. Kai! Kai, where are you, boy? Come here, Kai! Jean had been severely beaten. Police can't be sure, but she may have been alive for several hours before she died from her injuries. 
Around 7.30 in the morning, Jean's husband returned home from work. Jean? Jean? Kai? Realising that she wasn't there, he assumed she'd taken the dog out and went to find her. Jean. Jean. I just remember leaving my house and going to my uncle's and that's where my dad and my brother were. And we get told it was a murder investigation. I actually thought she'd died in a brain hemorrhage. Somebody does know something. And somebody knows who's responsible, whether it's through talk or anything. And it's just... I don't keep somebody else's secret, actually, whereas... End of the day, it's... I don't want somebody else's family going through this. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. <laughs> Heartbreakingly sad, well, Detective Chief Inspector Colin Kay from Police Scotland is leading this investigation. Understandably, you know, the family are torn to pieces by this. They need some answers tonight. Absolutely. You can see the terrible effect that it's had on Leanne and their family. Uh, Jim is a loving wife, mother and grandmother, and to lose her in these horrendous circumstances has been absolutely devastating. I would ask that if anybody is withholding any information or protecting any individual, they look to their conscience tonight and phone in with the name of that person. Let's look at the evidence you have. Let's look at this CCTV. Just take us through this again, would you, Colin? Jean's last sighting was captured on CCTV. She's seen walking from her home address along Bell Rock Street with the dog towards the entrance to Cranhill Park. Now, that's about half past ten on the night of the 13th of December last year. She's wearing pyjama bottoms, a three-quarter length black padded jacket with the hood up and flip-flops, which would tend to suggest that she wasn't out for any great length of time with the dog. Yeah. Normally, she's not out for any longer than 20 minutes, and on this occasion, that would be the case. Now, we reckon that uh, somebody knows something within the area. Now, if anybody's appeared at MD's door that night, maybe a bit dishevelled, it looks out of place, please come forward. Yeah, just briefly on that, I mean, you think the key to this lies within Cranhill itself, do you? Yes, the response from the community has been good. However, we still need their help. Jim is well known in the local area. She lived the majority of her adult life in Cran Hill. Now, if any, and we believe the answer lies within the local community. And if anybody has any concerns regarding any individual, someone who may be acting differently or out yeah. of character, please come forward tonight. OK, for now, Colin, thanks very much. I mean, you heard what Colin said. The answer to this surely lies with someone's conscience and now is the time to come forward i would urge you to do that do the right thing 0500 600 600 calls are free for most landlines some networks and mobile operators are going to charge or you can speak anonymously if you'd rather do that to crime stoppers let me give you their number they're on 0800 treble five treble one let's go to matthew news on some other appeals now. Detectives in Essex are investigating the murder of 33-year-old father of five, James Atfield, which happened in Colchester at the end of last month. Jim, as he was known, died after being found seriously injured in Castle Park in the city at around 5.45 a.m. on Saturday, March the 29th. He'd been stabbed 102 times. Jim was last seen at the River Lodge pub in the Middleborough area of Colchester the previous evening. He left at 10.09pm and unusually he left most of his pint behind. Now around an hour and 20 minutes later, a man who may have been Jim was seen sitting on the ground near to the lake in Castle Park. A couple was sitting on a bench nearby. Now if that was you, police would like to speak to you. They're also keen to speak to these two people, a man and a woman who may have been the couple on the bench and this woman who are all captured on CCTV walking through Lower Castle Park during the early hours of Saturday, March the 29th as they may have vital information. So if that is you or you know who they are, please call the incident room on 01245 282 103. Officers investigating a case from 2001 have tonight released CCTV of a man they think could help solve the mystery of what happened to 47-year-old Raymond Scott. Ray, a father of four, went missing on the 16th of November 2001 after spending the day helping his brother with building work. 
Well, despite repeated appeals, Ray's not been heard from since. His brother James is convinced that Ray has been killed. I know he's dead because I know my brother and he'd have been in touch. While they're hanging on to that information, there's four children and a wife and brothers and sisters that suffer every single day. If you know where that body is, because there is a body out there, tell us where it is. You know, let us close, let us, let's give these children closure. Well, what you're about to see now is the newly enhanced CCTV. It's from April 2002. And it shows a man police believe was making a phone call to Ray's brother from a payphone on the platform of South Harrow train station. Officers think that this phone call is related to Ray's disappearance and they're now urging that man to come forward. The mail in question arrives at the station about 8.36 on that Sunday morning. He then spends some minutes on the platform and he, he goes to the telephone box at 8.43 and makes a phone call to Ray's brother. Um, after that call is finished, he then returns to that phone box on two other occasions. So it may be he was trying to make another call or, or decided against it, I don't know. But in essence, that, that, that footage is quite important to us. It, it shows someone there making a phone call to Ray's brother um, at that, that time and we want to know what was that call about. So if, if that is you in the CCTV or you know who it is, then please do get in touch. There is a £20,000 reward for information that leads to a conviction. Right, still to come, an exclusive insight into the crimes of serial killer Joanna Dennehy. She is obsessed by the ability one human has to actually snuff out the life of another. And the hunt for the prolific burglar stealing from the rich and famous. Our freedom has been taken away and um, I would do anything to protect my family, but I, I'm a skinny little woman, there's not a lot I can do. But first, Martin's got some more wanted faces. We start this time with 24-year-old Luke Jones. Detectives want to trace him after a security guard was robbed while delivering cash to a bank in Prestwich in April last year. The guard suffered a broken jaw and £25,000 was stolen. Jones, who has links to Salford, Manchester and Edinburgh, is considered dangerous. So if you know where he is, call the police immediately. Six and seven are Daniel Williamson and Jermaine Green. Police want to trace the pair in connection with a series of residential burglaries in London and Surrey, during which prestige cars and gold jewellery worth hundreds of thousands of pounds have been stolen. 34-year-old Williams on the left here has this rather fetching tattoo on his neck and is known by the street name Twin, whereas Green on the right, who's also 34, is known as Dog. Both men have links across South London and should not be approached. Just call 999 if you see them. And finally tonight is Damien Duval d'Or. Police need to speak to him in connection with the possession and distribution of indecent images of children. 44-year-old Duval d'Or, who has previously used the name Johann Schmidt, has a South African accent and connections to Humberside and Ashford in Kent. So call and text on the usual numbers if you recognise any of tonight's faces. They're all online. A serial killer, psychopath and pathological liar. Joanna Dennehy described herself as a monster with a Moorish taste for blood. When earlier this year Dennehy was given a whole life sentence, she joined the ranks of Rosemary West and Myra Hindley as one of Britain's most infamous female murderers. Matthew's story of how she was caught contains some strong language. It was like a river of blood. She just kept coming for me the most dangerous of people. You can't predict what they're going to do. The story of Joanna Dennehy, the serial killer, is a dark and deeply disturbing one. It begins with a missing man and ends with three dead, their bodies dumped in ditches, and two others fighting for their lives. But how did this mother of two become a cold-blooded killer who murdered men for fun. Dennehy grew up in Hertfordshire with her parents and younger sister. Her childhood seems to have been comfortable and ordinary. But in a twisted fantasy, 
She claimed she'd been abused as a child and even that she'd killed her father. She is obsessed, fascinated by the ability one human has to actually snuff out the life of another. But she wouldn't be satisfied with just the fantasy of murder. On Friday the 29th of March last year, Peterborough landlord Kevin Lee went missing. He was a 48-year-old husband with two children. Within hours of his family contacting the police, a car was discovered on fire. Checks quickly revealed it was his. His car found as it was a blaze, uh, he not with it, um, was a particular interest to me that there was obviously something underlying that um, that was stopping him from being in contact with his family. That raised the level of suspicion that I was dealing with more than the missing person inquiry. Their worst fears were soon realised. The body of Kevin Lee was found in a ditch. He'd been repeatedly stabbed in the chest, including through the heart. In a final act of humiliation, he was wearing a black sequin dress pulled up above his waist. The missing person case was now a murder investigation. You're standing literally in the middle of a field. You realise you've got no CCTV, you've got no witnesses. It was evident to me that the answer would be around the people in Kevin's life. And Joanne Dennehy was one of them. There was a, sus a suspicion that Kevin was having more than a, a, a friendly relationship with Joanna. Dennehy lived in a shared house in Peterborough, owned by Kevin. She seemed to have a power and influence over some men. They would become obsessed and fascinated by her. Police decided to bring her in for questioning. It was very evident very quickly that she was making herself very, very hard to find. And she wasn't alone. Detectives linked her to longtime friend, seven foot three inch tall, Gary Stretch. It was clear to me that Dennehy and Stretch were involved in, in Kevin's death. And it was at that point that I took the difficult decision to put both their photographs into the media. Dennehy and Stretch together were a particularly dangerous combination. The pair got a thrill from their status, bragging they were like Bonnie and Clyde. Take a picture for me. They took these pictures while on the run. Officers from forces across the UK were now looking for them, and the police were about to get a major breakthrough. A detective in Norfolk was reviewing a theft at a petrol station and gave me that critical missing link, the registration number of a green Vauxhall Astra. Well, that was the absolute golden nugget. The car was traced to Hereford, 140 miles away, an area Stretch had links with. But by now, Dennehy had formed a sick plan. I want my fun. This time, to murder at random. I felt a thump in the back of my shoulder. So I just turned around and there was this girl. She said, I want to hurt you. I want to fucking kill you. <laughs> Kicked her at least twice. Punched her. Made no effect. She just kept coming. Dennehy left him for dead, but she hadn't satisfied her lust for blood. Within 20 minutes, she struck again. This time, the attack was even more savage. I mean, the first thought I can remember was, well, this is it, you know, this is... The day that I die, I mean, I, I just couldn't believe that I would survive because there was just, it was like a river of blood. She was now taking more risks, attacking in broad daylight 
but with multiple 999 calls reporting what she'd done, the police were closing in. At the very least in Cambridge here, we could show an association between Kevin and Joanna, and this was completely off the scale. Just 19 minutes after John Rogers was stabbed, police had caught Dennehy. She was arrested by officers in Hereford, was completely calm, offered no resistance, and even offered them the knife that she had carried out the attack with. Stretch wasn't in the car, but he was arrested within an hour. She was charged with one murder and the two attempted murders. She's facing an inevitable fate. The cavalier, defiant behaviour that we see in the footage is a desperate last attempt to avoid the consequences, not to have to face up to that. But there were further horrors to come. Two more bodies were found not far from Kevin Lee's. But the sense of shock that went through the incident room when I relayed that to, to my team was palpable. And it was, I guess, that critical moment where we all realised that we were dealing with something extraordinary now. Lukasz Slabozewski would turn out to have been Dennehy's first victim. Originally from Poland, the 31-year-old had only known her for a few days. He was stabbed once through the heart. The second body in the ditch, and also Dennehy's second victim, was 56-year-old John Chapman. He was murdered at the house he shared with her. She stabbed him once in the neck and five times in the chest, including again through the heart. She moves on from a simple, straightforward murder style um, to one which is much more frenzied. She's less focused on the um, ultimate destruction of the individual. She's done that, she's experienced that, and she's, she's liberated now to express her full sadistic desires. Only Dennehy knows exactly why she killed. During 14 hours of police interviews, she refused to cooperate. Did you murder Lushkash Slavajewski? No comment. Did you murder Kevin Lee? No comment. Did you murder John Chapman? No comment. But while awaiting trial, she surprised everyone, including her own legal team, by pleading guilty. At the Old Bailey, she laughed, joked and swore in court as she became only the third woman to be given a whole life term. She's in company of Hindley and West um, as female serial killers. The nature of her crimes are, are very different, but just as shocking. She's the only uh, female serial killer I can think of other than Rose West who has committed the crimes purely for their own sake, for their own sadistic thrill. Actually, what you've got is, is probably the most dangerous of people. You can't predict what they're going to do. Um, and it's absolutely right that she will die in prison. It's a staggering situation. There's a, the why. Was any more understood about the why? No, we don't. Partly because of that late guilty plea. Her sister said it was all about Dennehy trying to control the trial situation. We know she had a pretty normal childhood, doting parents, doing well at school, but by 15, she was beginning to go off the rails. Drink, skunk cannabis, she left home but nothing that fully explains that descent into chaos. I mean, by the end, she certainly loved the notoriety. She's said to have danced around the television when she saw herself in news reports. I spoke to one criminologist who suggested perhaps once the spotlight faded, she'd offer up some sort of explanation because, uh, rather like in the way of the Moore's murderer, to keep the focus on here, Ian Brady, control is everything yeah. and the why is the one thing they control. Just briefly, psychologists, the police, did they say she would have got, gone on killing? Oh, undoubtedly, they think. The number of attacks would have increased, also the level of violence would have increased. Once she crossed that line, all she wanted to do was kill. There are only two positive 
One, the police caught her so quickly. The other is that Joanna Dennehy will spend every day of the rest of her life in a prison cell. Matthew, thank you. Let's go to Martin now. More crooks on camera now, starting with an arson attack in Berkshire earlier this year. CCTV cameras installed at a private house in Slough capture a group of men walking along a residential street late on a Monday night in February. Two of the men walk up to the front door where they spray some sort of flammable liquid onto the floor. A third man then appears and throws a match, but it doesn't catch light, so he tries again. This time the liquid ignites and engulfs the door in flames. The men then run off. Thankfully, no one was injured. Now, these men set light to a family home. Tell us who they are tonight. A group of friends walk up to a bus stop in central London early on a Saturday morning last June. They check the timetable before two of them walk off, leaving one woman to wait for her bus. Also at the bus stop is a man wearing jeans and a dark jacket and carrying a rucksack, as well as an older guy in a suit. The older man catches his bus, leaving the woman and the man in the dark jacket alone. After a few minutes, the man suddenly lunges at her and sexually assaults her. He then runs off. Now, those images of the attacker weren't great, but these ones, which were captured by another camera, are. Who is he? A man wearing jeans, a hard hat and a high-vis vest walks into a branch of Lloyd's Bank on a Thursday afternoon last month. Having ensured he's as visible as possible, he's also forgotten a vital piece of his disguise. You're supposed to pull up your mask before you walk into the bank. He approaches the counter, where he finally pulls up his mask and pulls out what looks like a handgun, pointing it straight at the terrified female cashier. He demands she hand over money, but she refuses. He waves the gun around as the frightened employees try to escape to safety. Getting nothing, he leaves empty-handed, concealing the gun in his pocket as he does. He tried to commit armed robbery whilst wearing a luminous jacket. Name this bungling bank robber tonight. Well, if you can name anyone featured in tonight's CCTV, please get in touch in the usual ways. News now on some previous cases. In January, we showed you this shocking footage of a man smashing a beer bottle in the face of another man outside a nightclub in Harrogate. We had lots of calls to the studio that night, naming him as Stephen Mark Gibson from Easywold in North Yorkshire. And the following day, he handed himself in to police. Well, earlier this month, Gibson was given a 20-month suspended prison sentence in order to pay £1,500 compensation. Apparently, the whole thing happened after an argument over their sexual prowess. Now, in November, we showed you this CCTV of an attempted robbery at the Barclays Bank in Llandaff in Cardiff, during which a security guard was ambushed as he made a cash delivery. Well, an off-duty police officer from the West Midlands was watching the show that night, and he identified the robber as Naeem Ario Day. Earlier this month, the 21-year-old was convicted and sentenced to 32 months in prison. Great result. And finally, Last year, we showed this footage of a man who indecently exposed himself and committed a sex act in front of two young girls on a bus in Devon. A mental health consultant was watching the show, recognised him as a former patient and contacted the police. As a result, 39-year-old Daniel Prattley from Oakhampton was arrested and charged. Earlier this month, he was jailed for 12 months, suspended for a year. All great results and all thanks to your calls. Next, the investigation into an extremely prolific burglar with very expensive tastes. As you can see, he's been captured on camera, breaking into several multi-million pound homes in South London. He targets the rich and famous, and detectives believe he's responsible for over 140 offences, including at the family home of the tennis legend, Boris Becker. Well, D.I. Daniel O'Sullivan is in charge of catching this fellow. Um, what do we know about this guy? We know this individual's targeted a number of wealthy families in the Wimbledon village area. Uh, he's targeted uh, safes and he's cut CCTV systems. 
Uh, we're also aware that uh, he's stolen very few items and a lot of people don't actually know they've been burgled. Okay, now we've said 140 uh, crimes, that's a lot of crimes. He does slip up sometimes, even though he probably considers himself something of a professional. Let's take a look, Daniel, at this CCTV. Tell us what we're seeing here. This is uh, imagery, imagery from uh, 2009, where we see the suspect with his hand over his face. Right. Uh, and he appears to be talking into some kind of dictaphone. Right, now what's coming up next? When, when is this and what's he up to? This is from uh, March 2013 and uh, he gets caught on um, CCTV camera, which is uh, um, a rare glimpse of his face. Um, and we've got another one here. He's in somebody's kitchen here, is he? That's correct, yes. This is from this year, and we can see him meticulously searching uh, kitchen units and uh, trying to identify something that's still. Right, OK. Now, now as we mentioned, um, Boris Becker's family, their, their house was uh, broken into. Luckily, the Beckers weren't at home on either occasion. But Boris's wife, Lily, has spoken to us about how it feels to be targeted by this man. Not only do I have to switch on all the alarms, I have to leave some lights on in the house. And when, I'm st when I can't enjoy my living room because it's connected to the garden where he's, t where he's jumped over a few times, that freedom has been taken away. And um, I would do anything to, you know, protect my family, but I, I'm a skinny little woman, there's not a lot I can do. He can't make this his profession. He cannot just get away with this and take people's stuff. We've even talked about moving and really creating a, almost a fort, but making it so safe that I feel safe. And that shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't. That was Lily Becker there. So if you know who this man is, then please do call the number on our screen now. And if you yourself have been a victim of crime, there's always the victim support line. They're on 0845 30 30 900. Just time now for a very quick last update on what's coming on the phones. Here's Martin. Now remember that CCTV we showed you, the man being assaulted in the hotel, being hit over the head and kicked, being hit by that skateboard. Well, we've had lots of interesting calls coming in, lots of people giving names for those suspects. That is absolutely crucial. Detectives are following those calls as we speak. You can see that footage, of course, online. Please keep all those calls coming in. Kirsty. Thanks, Martin. Right, that's everything for now. But remember, all of tonight's appeals are on our website and you can stay up to date with how the cases progress via Twitter. The phone lines, well, they're going to be open until midnight tomorrow and we're going to be back again tonight at 10.40. That's just after the news with the latest on what we hope will have been a very promising night on the phones. Uh, viewers in Northern Ireland are going to have to wait until 10 past 11. But for now, for me and everyone on the team, thanks for your calls. They make a difference. Bye-bye.